Our subject today that, that I'll, I'd like to share is unlocking the promises. Um, and I'm sharing this message in the context of a deep belief that Jesus is coming. And, and that's the context in which I want to present this message. While ever we're not really going to be uh, dwelling on necessarily prophetic issues or any actual physical of the coming of Jesus, I'm, I'm presenting this in that context that Jesus is coming and this unlocking the promises is essential for, for us to be ready for Jesus to come. Um, some of the things here that I want to share, it's pretty basic. It's nothing necessarily new, but I personally find that I have to keep reminding myself of some of the fundamentals of, of the Bible, of, of, of Christianity, because we can overlook them sometimes. We can be so busy trying to work out the problems of life that the answers are actually really close and, and often we overlook them because of terminology issues or the way we use words. For instance, if I was to give you three words, faith, belief and hope, could you distinguish the difference between all three of those words? Faith, belief and hope. You know, if you're having an exam, you think, yeah, I hope I'll pass. Or you could also say, you know, I'll have a bit of faith that I'll pass. Faith in my own ability. Or, um, or you could say that, um, I believe I'll pass. And often in our language, we, we use these words and we, we, we blur the meanings that actually... The scriptures are using them in and therefore when we come to use these bread and butter words, I mean we use them all the time, when we're looking through the Bible and we see the word faith and we see the word belief and we see the word hope and we think, yeah, yeah, I know what that means and we just skim straight over it and I find myself, I've done this so many times and the Lord's had to tap me on the shoulder and say, I don't think you're actually getting the point. I don't think you're understanding. It's simple but it's it's still profound. And so I'd like to just go through these first three scriptures. Hebrews 11 verse 1, Proverbs 13 verse 2, and Luke 8, 5 through to 13. will break down how the Bible, in, in the majority of cases, is using these words. And once we uh, define how they're used, it may give you, and it may not, but for me, it gave more depth to actually what the scriptures were, were talking about. And it gave, me, it gave me encouragement in my own situation. When I, when, when I see and I honestly believe Jesus is coming soon, I sometimes can get discouraged of my own situation. I think, you know, I'm battling with this or that or, you know, different temperaments. And I know, you know, they're, they're hard to battle with. And, and whatever the situation that you're going through, we all go through the same sort of stuff. But when I understood some of this, it made sense to me and it gave me hope. It gave me some encouragement. And I hope that you can come away encouraged and having some idea of how to unlock the promises in God's word. I'll be reading from the King James Version, if that's okay. Um, I understand there are different versions. So when I'm using some of these words, I, I'm using the, the context that I'm reading. But they, they shouldn't really stray too far from each other. Um, Hebrews 11 verse 1, well-known text about faith. Hebrews 11 verse 1. Hebrews 11 verse 1, it says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. I've always, I've always sort of thought that faith is some ethereal uh, cognitive function that you've got to have to believe something that's fairly unbelievable. Are you with me on that? Something that you can't actually see happening it, to all appearances. It looks like it's not going to happen, but I'm going to believe it's going to happen and we call that faith. Yeah? It says here that faith is the substance. The substance. Interesting word. Substance just means simply the subframe or the the foundation the building blocks this word substance the you know when we talk about you boil all the substances down you get 
You get those elements, don't you? Okay? So faith is the substance of things hoped for. So here's this word hope. Proverbs 13 verse 2. Proverbs 13 verse 2 says that hope deferred makes the heart sick. But when the desire comes, it is a tree of life. So it's using the word hope as in exchange. It, it switches the word in the second part of the verse to the word desire. Okay, so I don't even know how to spell desire. Anyway, you get the idea. Is that right? Good. Um, I'm fairly uneducated, so you can, you can I double check myself every time. But anyway. Desire, the word desire. So if, if we understand that in Proverbs 13 verse 2, it switches these two words, hope and, and flicks over to hope deferred makes a heart sick, but when the desire comes, it is a tree of life. So can you appreciate this word as, as a desire? As a Christian, what is our desire? As a Christian, it's to get to heaven. Yeah, 1 Timothy 1.1, 1, 1, I think it says, and it might not be actually that, but you can go and check it if you're Bereans. It says that Jesus Christ is our desire. Jesus is also known in the Bible as the desire of nations. There's also a book that I recommend reading called The Desire of Ages. And it's all about who? Jesus Christ. So this Use of the word hope, and, as, and, in, and in the Christian context, in the Bible's context, the hope of Adam and Eve was the Redeemer. The hope of everybody has been Jesus Christ himself. That is your hope and my hope if we're Christians, and if we boil it right down to it. So when we come back to Hebrews 11.1, 1, it says, Faith is the substance of things hoped for. Okay, so you're hoping for something... But faith is the building blocks or the, or the subframe of the very thing you're hoping for. Does that make sense? So it's actual material, like it's tangible. The substance of things hoped for. And then what's the next part of the verse? It's the evidence of things not seen. So... What is something that is a substance? It's the subframe of something you're actually hoping for. It's actually not the full thing though. And it's an evidence of the thing that perhaps you haven't even seen yet. Has anyone actually seen Jesus Christ face to face? Okay, so faith being, a, let, let's, let's think of something else that's not spiritual. Let's turn to the physical and think what in the physical world is the building block or the, or the foundation of something you want and that very thing is an evidence of, of it while ever you cannot see it. What's that? It's a seed. Does a seed of a plant fit the requirement as required in Hebrews 11 verse 1. Is a seed, let's say, let's just say you've never seen a coconut tree. Never seen one. Let, no, let's change it. Let's go avocado. I like avocados. So you've never seen an avocado tree and someone's just describing this fruit that's like just margarine or butter, just straight out. You just spread it on and it's, it's beautiful. And, and you, you can't actually appreciate that. It's like, it sounds too modified or something. If you had the seed of an, if you had the avocado seed, is it the avocado tree? Yes or no? Well, it's it's actually not the it's not the tree. It's the seed, but is it the subframe of the tree? Absolutely, everything that need that that the tree requires, or or that the whole building block of that tree is contained in the seed. Now, is the seed an evidence of the tree existence? Yeah, yet you can't see the tree yet. Okay, so simply this, and I want you to understand that faith is not just cognitive function of, of you to be able to believe something that's really hard to believe. That's actually not really how the Bible is defining faith. And if that 
if that's new to me, if that's new to you, it was to me as well. And I thought, that's interesting. Because sometimes, you know, you're praying for something. You think, I can't actually see it happening. But no, we've got to believe. We've got to, and I sort of got to convince myself that. And, and it just becomes a mental exercise. And if you're good at it, wow, you can believe it. You can believe amazing things if you're good at it, but what if you're not good at it? What if your mind is? What if your mind tends to doubt? Is it? Be, are you disadvantaged because you're maybe a little more of a doubter than someone who can just believe weird things? There's a lot of people who have left the church just because they can't wrap their minds around something they can't see. And then they, and then we say, well, you're faithless. But is that really actually what the Bible faith is actually talking about? And I'd like to suggest that it's not. Biblical faith, the faith that we need for salvation, is not dependent on your cognitive function. It's not dependent on the cleverness of your own mind. It's something bigger than you. It's something outside of you, and it's a gift that you can get, whether you're a doubter or whether you're not. It's a seed. And this text in Luke chapter 8, verse 5 through to 13 talks about the seed it's a parable about a sower and the soul went to sow and in the parable jesus says the seed is what is the word of god the seed is the word of god in fact jesus said to his disciples he said if you had faith the size of a mustard seed you could do what does that mean that it's dependent on your cognitive function to believe that you could pick up a mountain and move it? Or is it that the seed itself has the power to move the mountain? And if you just had that seed, if you just had the seed, everything within that seed is achievable by virtue of the seed itself. Are you with me? So Luke 8, 5 talks about a seed but it talks about different outcomes and I don't know about you but as a Christian I've met with lots of Christians and lots of ex-Christians who, 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 who swear black and blue that Christianity doesn't work it's, it, it's, it doesn't do anything but just because they had a different outcome just because the seed responded differently in their minds, is it a fault of the seed or is it a fault of the condition in which the seed is housed? If I gave you the avocado seed, you wrapped it in a piece of glad wrap, stuck it in your fridge and I said, well, you know, the tree will, will sprout within three weeks and, and whatever the requirements are for that seed, that, and, and you wrapped it in the fridge and you said, you lied to me. Did I? Okay. Also, what I want us to understand about faith, that inside the seed we're going to call faith, which is the word of God, according to the parable, which we can, you can look up in your own time. This seed has promises in it. So let's now look at an avocado seed. Inside the avocado seed, what is promised? What is a promise in that avocado seed? Okay, fruit is a promise. That's cool. What else is a, is a promise? A tree? Tree? Okay, roots. Are they promises? Are they promised inside that seed? Yep. Branches, wood. Yeah, you name it. It's all there. It's all promised in there. And so, how I'd like you to... Um, these texts, and, I, and I, I encourage you to think about the Word of God as a seed that has all these promises inside that require unlocking, that, that are there and, 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 and are sure as much as, as the fruit in a seed. But how many people have ever had a seed and never gotten any fruit? How many people have ever had God's word and still never had the fruits of the spirit of love, joy, peace and long-suffering and gentleness and kindness and goodness and faith? And yet they've got the word. You've got it on your lap. Inside the seed, actually the seed, most of the seed isn't actually the building block itself. There's a little, 
there's, there's the little kernel inside which has what inside it? It has the DNA of the plant inside it and yet on the outside there's all the, all the nutrients or just the, the fibrous stuff that, that isn't actually the, the bottom line. The, the, the fundamentals of it. And so I'd like to suggest that God's word is a lot of pulp. There's a lot of paper. There's a lot of ink that's all surrounding. And yet, inside the heart of this book is DNA for your victory. Is the victory gained on Calvary? Is, is a seed. And now this seed now is not physical. It's spiritual mental seed. In other words, what we have here, we have a mind. There is the thinking, the thought processes of victory gained right here. Because Christianity, and I'll be honest with you, Christianity is a mind cure to sin. Christianity, as it's intended by Jesus Christ, is a mind cure to your problems. Mental, your habits, your character issues. The solution is here. The promises are here. But yet we, we just see the pulp. We see the ink. We see the theory. And yet we never unlock the victory in it. We never actually grasp the faith as intended in Hebrews 11.1. 1, that faith that can actually grow in and of itself. We're busy trying to convince our own mind and we're trying to do our own, you know, psychotherapy of yeah you've got to be positive you've got to have the you know you've got to improve your personality to achieve what you want or you know whatever the world will teach in psychology essentially without the gospel it's the pulp it's not the real deal so if inside the seed is the promises and, and when, I, when I realized that, I, I, I would start to look at the scriptures as God's promises. To me personally, but also to the whole world's sin problem. And there's some amazing promises God has said. And the promises, he first started, there was a man called Abraham, and God made promises to him. And those promises were transferred through his children, but ultimately... To whose seed was the promise made? The promises of the Bible, the whole lot. The, 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 the city whose builder and maker was God, the, the country that was pure, the, the blessing where all the families of the earth would be blessed. You, you think of all the promises that God has said in the Bible. Victory, where there's a Bible verse that says that sin shall not have dominion over you. What a promise. And who, to whom are these promises made? I want to ask you this question. The promises are actually made to Jesus Christ as an individual. So when he was born, he received the word, okay, the seed, the word became flesh. This amazes me. So you have the word, I don't know what form he was exactly beforehand. I, I'm not, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know that, obviously. I, it's a mystery in some ways, but we know that the Word was with God, the Word was God, and then we know that that Word became flesh and dwelt among us. In other words, the Word became personified. It, became, it, 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 turned, it turned into a human being like you and me in a, problem, in a problematic world where you and I live. And as... As the child grew, as Jesus Christ grew, everything about Jesus' life was by promise. Are you with me? It was by promise. In other words, he was born of the Holy Ghost from birth and everything that he went through was a matter of promise. Who was the father of Jesus? It wasn't Joseph. It was God. He was the only begotten of the father. In other words, out of all, out of all, out of all the, the beings that ever exist, there's only ever once, ever once, where the legitimate father 
in, in a direct line as far as the DNA is concerned. Or I, don't, I mean, I, I don't know if it's... There's some mysteries there I don't quite understand. But Jesus... There's no one like Jesus. Because what took place in that incarnation in Bethlehem is something that is just... It hits me. Oh, I don't even know. You, you hear what I'm saying? The incarnation of Jesus Christ as a person, what we see, in, as we read, we see the person. We see the mind. We see the thoughts. We see the speech. We see who he is. Beautiful character. Balances everything in perfect symmetry. We worship him as Lord. He's coming again. But the thing is, he became a seed. And that seed, in the physical, Jesus grew. Everything was by promise. In other words, when you're growing up, there are certain inheritances you receive from your parents. Your looks, your eyes, and it's a combination between the two. You, there's this like merging between the the two parents, and you receive your inheritance by who you are. But now, we have a promise that we can have a new inheritance. We can have new parents. We, we don't have to be stuck in the, in the ways and the habits and, and this fallen condition that, that deliberate, that... that Cap captures us. You know, I mean, I don't know if you've ever been captured by your own habits. These are things I'm talking about. The physical ailments, they'll be fixed up when Jesus comes. Our mind, unless the seed is planted in the mind, we actually don't have hope. You have no hope of an avocado tree unless you have the seed. Does that make sense? You have no hope of salvation, of eternal life, unless you have the seed of eternal life. He that has Jesus has eternal life because Jesus is eternal life. Does that make sense? And so the promise of everlasting life is Jesus himself. The rich young ruler came to Jesus as if it was some tangible material that you could just get. And Jesus says, come and follow me. And you'll, you know, invited him to keep the commandments of God through a relationship of walking with Jesus and the rich young ruler declined that relationship of walking with Jesus. And therefore, that the rich young ruler missed out on the very thing he was seeking. And so I would encourage you to look at the scriptures as who you can become. When you're looking at Jesus Christ, I mean, you're looking at it in a fallen context. The Bible is is very unique in that it is written in the context of mistakes and failures and, and blunders. That's the context in which the Bible is written. But inside that, there's this thread. Outside of all the pulp and all the stories, there's this, there's this thread of promise. That's what you want to latch on to. That's what you want to latch on to in your personal life. Take the Word of God and find the promises. Because when you... When we get them in the heart, the, the obtaining of those promises is a matter of inheritance, not of works. It's not a matter of your effort. It's a matter of it developing and you allowing the conditions for it to develop. Does that make sense? So Matthew 8, 5 through to 13 is a story about a centurion. A centurion had a problem. Perhaps you've got a problem. Perhaps I've got a problem today. The centurion had a problem. He had a sick servant. Obviously, a kind hearted centurion cared for his servant. And I would imagine this servant was at the point of death because it, you know, it, it, was, it was critical. So the centurion has a problem. And he knows of somebody who, who has the power to solve the problem. And who's that? Jesus. Okay, so 
He has a problem and he knows about Jesus. In fact, he believes in Jesus as, as the authority. So why couldn't the centurion just say, Jesus has the power to heal my son and my servant. I'm cool with that. Couldn't have he done that? Why not? Is that faith? If, you, if that centurion goes, Christ has the power. Christ has the power to heal my servant. My servant is sick. I believe, and here's the word belief, because the, the context of Luke 8, 5 to 13 is the belief is the reception or the, the putting it into your innermost soul. Hope is the desire. Faith is the seed. Belief is you taking it in. Okay? So, the, the centurion could have said, I believe that Jesus has the power to heal my servant and I believe he will and I'm going to start to thank God for that. Is there anything wrong with that? Have you ever had a loved one who is sick? And you might have prayed for them. You might have said, Lord, I know you have the power to heal. I believe that. Maybe you were sick and you prayed, Lord, heal me. And it didn't happen. Anyone had that experience? Is it challenging? Does it challenge you? It's challenging, isn't it? But the, but the issue here is that we... we um, this is the error of, of this mindset. Is that I believe Jesus has the power. Okay, that's correct. I'm sick, that's a fact. And then I have, I'm going to exercise my faith in that I'm going to use my mind to say, yes, Jesus will heal me and I'll thank him for it. The, the issue is, we don't know if in the scenario of my life, that is God's will. Okay? In other words, you don't have the word from God that this very personal, individual situation is going to be healed. You may not have that. I mean, you may. And if you do, then that's a different story. But if you don't actually have that, there is evidence, strong evidence in the Bible that God didn't answer prayers the way people wanted them to. Okay? Strong evidence in the Scriptures. You just think of the Apostle Paul as a pretty common known one of his, of his ailment. We, the scholars assume that it was eyesight, Perhaps, I, you know, I don't actually know, but if he had an eyesight issue, he prayed how many times? Three times. And what did God end up telling him? Just don't ask me again. My grace is sufficient for you. My strength is made perfect in weakness. So God challenges Paul back and says, your request of your personal, individual circumstance, I'm not going to grant that in the, in the context of the right here and now. You're going to have to just trust me. And he didn't get it answered. The centurion, and this is where the faith of the centurion is incredible. The centurion had the problem and he had a belief in Jesus. But he had to go to Jesus to get the word. Turn with me to Matthew. Let's look at Matthew chapter 8. Look at, the, look at this example an example that Jesus highly recommends as a faith that didn't even exist in all of Israel. In, in Matthew, Matthew 8. And starting in verse 5. So now the centurion had, had come to Jesus. Verse 5. And when Jesus was entered into Capernaum, there came unto him a centurion beseeching him and saying, Lord, my servant lieth at home sick of the palsy, grievously tormented. And Jesus said unto him, I will come and heal him. The centurion answered and, and said, Lord, I'm not worthy that thou shouldest come under my roof, but speak the word only, and my servant shall be healed. So the centurion has the problem. He has a belief in the power of Jesus Christ. But before he can actually connect that, that, that desire and the belief and the faith all together, he needs to have the words spoken by Jesus. 
Because if Jesus doesn't speak the word, there is actually no guarantee it's going to happen. And the centurion could have his mind exercised all he liked. But unless it was the word of Jesus Christ that was going to do it, nothing would heal the servant. Are you following me? What I, and I... I don't want to repeat too much, but I just want to labour on this point. The, the, word, the spoken word is the promise. And it is the spoken word that your hope and that your belief actually hang on. If it wasn't for the spoken word, there's nothing to hang on. There's nothing for your mind to grasp. And if there's no spoken word, then it de- then, it's, then we switch as humans to, to try and convince ourselves and trying to, to say, yeah, yeah, I'm spiritual, you know. And, and then we meet bitter, bitter disappointment and we think, where did I go wrong? So the simple thing is, if the word is spoken, you don't have to doubt. You don't have to double, double guess the situation. If there, is a, if, the, the, if there is a word, and the Bible doesn't necessarily deal with every single personal scenario in the here and now. In other words, you can have a loved one that is sick and dying, and they may not be healed, but that's no, uh, that's no scrap on the scriptures, on the, on the word of God. But if you have... A word from Jesus Christ that he will be healed. You can have all the confidence in the world. And the reason why you can have all the confidence in the world is found in Hebrews chapter 6, that God cannot lie. God can't lie. God's promises, he, sw- he swore, he, 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 made, he swore by no greater, he swore by his own existence. In other words, if the promise fails, his existence should should cease. That's that's what Hebrews six seventeen says, talking about the promises made to Abraham, that they were so certain, that they were so sure that God swore on himself that they would come to pass. So let's turn away from the particular scenarios that we face in the here and now. They're talking about the temporal, the physical those things where there's not always the yes and the no. Sometimes we don't know. And it's no doubt to say, you know what, Lord, I have someone who I love dearly. I have an, I have an illness and I'm going to lay it before you. It's, it's not doubt to not be not sure whether God will heal you or not. That's not doubt. It's doubt where God says, you will be healed. And you say, well, I don't believe you. That's doubt. But it's not doubt to not be sure... Of the word. Was the centurion sure before he left his home to find Jesus? He wasn't sure. He had to go and say, Christ, you just need to speak the word. And when you've spoken the word, my servant will be healed. I know that. Because I'm a man of authority. And I can say to this servant, you go and do that. And he'll go and do it. I'll say to that servant, you go there and that will be done. And so he recognised in Jesus had this power to create the creative power of the word. This will be healed. So, by virtue of Jesus Christ's power, it will be done. And so now comes the situation where we as individuals, as Christians, battle in our life. Are there, are there promises that says that we will gain victories over temptation and sin? Is is the word giving us certain guarantees in our life about certain scenarios, yes or no? Here's one. What if I'm guilty of sin and guilt is crushing the life out of me? Is there a spoken promise of God that if I confess my sins, he'll be faithful and just to forgive my sins? Is that a promise? Can I claim that? Do I ever have to doubt that? No. Can you, can you start to see the difference? 
of as Christians how we should be interacting with God's word. When it comes to salvation, the promises are clear. All the promises, this is where um, in, um, in Corinthians, it's actually not on there. In Corinthians, it says that all the promises of God are in Christ, yes and amen, as in it shall be done. As in all of God's promises that he has ever said to us, as, uh, that apply to us, are in Jesus. So you need to have the seed in your heart. It's a yes and an amen, as in it's going to happen. Does it happen? If I plant the seed, do I get the fruit the next day? Okay, so now comes an, another element that I want you to understand. That when we understand faith, which is the substance of what I'm hoping for, ultimately the character of Jesus Christ, that's my hope, I have to allow time. I have to have patience. Does a farmer have to have patience for the, for the precious fruit of the earth to come forward? Absolutely. This one here, Luke 11, 1 to 3, talks about the Lord's Prayer. And we're guided of certain things to pray for, certain things to thank God for, acknowledge his power. And then in the second part, after the prayer, Jesus talks about your, your posture in prayer. What should be your posture in your request to heaven? And then in this, the third part of, of Luke 11, it's about God's posture in prayer. So you've got the prayer itself, how you position yourself in that prayer, and how God positions himself in that prayer. And it hinges around his promises. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And the posture that we're to have is a friend... Having someone come at midnight to his house and having no bread, you don't have, you, you're, you're, you're in lack, you're in need. And then you go to your friend's house who you know has bread, being God, he's got the bread, he's got the goods, I don't have the goods, I'm in need. And you go there and you ask him as if he's not going to give it to you. And the parable of, of the friend coming at midnight was that the friend only gave it because he, because he was starting to annoy him and he wanted to go to bed. That's the only reason. So this is our posture in our request before God to pray as if we have to convince God to give it to us. But is that God's posture? Is that how God positions himself when we pray? No. The second part was that ask and shall be given. Knock, shall be open. Seek. And you shall find, and then he talks about a father wanting to give good gifts to his children. If your son came up asking for an egg, would you give him a snake? And then it's so clear, it's so obvious. You being evil, as in human beings fallen with messed up situations, still can give lovely gifts to our kids. How much more, in comparison, as much as God the Father is higher than us, is God willing to give us the Holy Ghost to those who ask him? God is keen to give. We need to be in a posture as if, as if God doesn't want to give, although he is keen to give. But the situation is that when we find the word, it's got to be meaningful to us. In this parable about the seed, what environment is the, seed, the seed's potential unlocked in. Okay? The seed has all the promises and the seed has to be unlocked. What environment does Jesus say in this parable will unlock the full potential of God's power? What is it? It's the fertile ground. It goes in deep. How do we get the word in deep? Because the promises of God are sure and they're all in here. But if we want to be surface Christians, if we actually don't want to be ready for Jesus to come, when Jesus comes, we'll say, oh, but, but we ate in your presence and we did all these things in your name. And Jesus says, well, I don't, 
I don't know you. There's this depth, the lack of depth. If you want to get the depth, it's the only condition in which this seed will unlock all the promises of God. In other words, if you want to be blessed more than you can even imagine, get the seed in deep. Get the word in deep. Not to argue with your neighbours, not to convince someone of doctrine, although the doctrine is critically important. That's not actually what we study for. It's housed in here. How do you get the seed in deep? See, the treasures, God's treasures of value, he doesn't scatter everywhere. Treasures are hidden. Promises are hidden. And what I want to suggest to you is that there are promises for your problems and my problems today hidden in here that actually God has spoken for us. But if we're not finding them, we'll miss out on them. Because Matthew 13 talks about a man who went and he found great treasure. And when he found great treasure, he went and sold everything that he had to purchase it. And the parable continued about someone looking for goodly pearls, but when he found the pearl of great price, he did something that, that re represented its value. Matthew chapter 6 says this, Where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. The secret to unlocking the powerhouse of heaven, all of God's promises that are in Christ, is for you to treasure it. But how can you treasure it when you treasure everything else? How can I treasure it when I have other idols, when I have other treasures, things that I value? You know, turn the TV off. Oh, that's tough. That's really hard because I treasure it. You want to know what you value? You see how much you crumble when it's taken away. That's how much you value it. You want to know what you value? What do you speak about most? Because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth will speak. And God's been challenging me personally. And this, I'm just sharing some of the things that I go, I'm going through. God's challenging me and has clearly identified there are some things that are your idols. And you know, I don't like hearing that. I think, no, no, no. Okay, yes, Lord. Okay, intellectually, yes, yes. But I'm like a rebellious child that's, uh, that, that disagrees afterwards. I need to want it. I need to search for it. And when you search for it, and you want it as if God doesn't want to give it, and then you find it, it becomes treasure, doesn't it? How much have you been searching for the promises for you in your personal life? How, many, how, how much time are you spending digging for the treasures? Or, or are we just looking at the, the, the gravel on the road and expecting to find the diamonds? You won't value them if they're scattered on the road. There's no value in that. There's value when we search for it as for hidden treasure. When we want it as if God doesn't want to give it to us. And so therefore, a lot of Christians, just by pure lack of endurance, miss out. The Bible is clear, he that endures to the end, the same will be saved. Do you really want to unlock the promises of God? Because if you don't, you won't. But if you do, the value, the intrinsic value of God's word will, be, will increase until it becomes the biggest thing in your life. Until you find, here's the, here's the promise for this situation in my life and I'm going to claim it and I'm going to give it the time to come to fruition. And I believe if we study the scriptures like that, because we want to gain the victories, because we want the promises of God, because we want Jesus in the innermost depth, we will inherit eternal life. There's no room for doubt. To doubt that would be to doubt the sun's existence. Or to be worried that the sun will fall out of the sky in the middle of the day.
Let's close with Jeremiah 15 and verse 16. Jeremiah 15 and verse 16. Jeremiah 15, verse 16, Thy words were found, and I did eat them. And thy word was unto me the joy and the rejoicing of my heart, for I am called by thy name, O Lord God of hosts. Be called by his name means you're his son. You have the same last name. I found the words, and they became meaningful to me. Whatever your situation is, brothers and sisters, find the word that is meaningful to you, to the scenario that you're in. The direct promise may not be there to give you necessarily what you want in the here and now. But God's long term is always for your best. And so you can just rest on that word and say, this is everything to me. And you can start experiencing an unravelling of God's promises in your life that ultimately will come to that tree of life on that day when you can pick the fruit, on that river when Jesus comes. I believe it's coming soon. I hope you're encouraged by this and that faith is just not your mind exercise. It is the word of God, but you need to believe it in the innermost part of your life. It's my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.